Welcome to the World of Horror podcast. I'm Mom. And I'm Mac. And this is the podcast where we share our love of international horror. Fear is universal, but we are not afraid of subtitles. A disclaimer, the thoughts and opinions expressed are ours only. We have no credentials of any kind. We just like horror and enjoy discussing international horror movies. Also, these discussions will include spoilers. You have been warned. This week, we watched the 2008 Swedish vampire coming-of-age slash horror film Let the Right One In, and the 2010 American remake Let Me In. Well, hoes, we're going to move on to our first segment, Mom and Mac Chat. Hi, Mac. How's it going? Good, Mom. How are you? Well, I'm doing okay. well. <laughs> yeah, wait. That's just always what in my head is like, you know, you know how in how did this get made? That's that's how like how Paul and Diane do it, and I think it's so cute. Like whenever he's like, "Oh yeah, hey Diane," she always goes, "Good, Paul. How are you?" <laughs> it's like <laughs> that's what I was going for. Let's see. Oh, I am it. doing. How is anyone in this hellscape we call an Earth? <laughs> I, yeah, man, every day has kind of been a little bit of a struggle, and I don't really have anything going on in my life either. Maybe that's why it's a struggle. Um, yeah, man, pandemics, huh? Not easy to live in one. <laughs> no. I, like, I Not keep great. having these, like, you know, okay, so first it was, like, mm, I'm sad, and then it was, like, well, I started a new hobby, and then it was, like, I'm not doing good. And then I was like, I'm actually doing great. What am I talking about? And now I'm back down where it's like, no, this sucks. I hate this. Um, so I've been trying to think of ways to not feel like that. Like today at the end of my work day, I was like, I can't do this anymore. And so I left. <laughs> and then I was like, even though I didn't finish my work, but I was like, I can't do it. And I left. And then when I was driving home, I was like, I can't do this, but I have to because I have to drive. And then when I got home, I was like, <laughs> I want to do something. Per well, I was going to go to Whole Foods. And then I was like, I can't do that. And then I was home and um, uh, I did scoop Brandwin's poop and I did take my testosterone injection, which is has been three days late. So I was really proud about that. But um, yeah, I mean, there's not even anything wrong. It's just like <sighs> getting up every day. I'm like another day of this, huh? <laughs> well, yeah, I think what's kind of frustrating is we don't know when it's going to end. Yeah. There's and nothing to like sort of look towards. These, yeah. We sort of get these teasers like, mm -hmm. um, well, when a bunch more people get vaccinated, then we'll be able to move around a little more. Um, and, but, but then there's like supply issues with the vaccine. Like I, and it's, I, I don't, I, I'm like in, I mean, I could potentially be in the group that gets, uh, the vaccine like middle of March. Mm. I mean, pot who knows potentially though. And I have this like, um, thing on my phone mm -hmm. where I get uh, updates about vaccines and stuff. And so I got, uh, it'll be like. Uh, now, you know, appointments are now open. And mm. then like two minutes later, no, no, no word of a lie. All appointments have been filled. That doesn't so surprise me. I was talking to my psychiatrist. Um, she and I love to gab. I really love her. Shout out to uh, my psychiatrist. I guess I won't dox her. Um, she, I really like her a lot. Um, she's like, you know, I really has it lately. I've been, I just have been saying anyone who's older than me, I call like that oh that's an older lady but uh, uh, when i say that people get offended now like when i was a kid people didn't get offended but now that i'm in my like almost mid-20s <laughs> people are like what do you mean by older it's like i don't know older than me <laughs> like but anyways she is an older lady and um man i just love her like i feel like like you would like her too like she just wants to chat sometimes, but like, you know how sometimes people want to chat and you're like, I don't want to talk to you. But whenever she wants to talk to me, I'm like, yeah, I could, I could go for a chat right now. Um, and she was telling me that she could get a vaccine now 
except Mm -hmm. she can't get a fucking appointment. She's like, I've been able to get one for a month, except I haven't because I can't get an appointment. I can't possibly get, she's like me and everybody else I work with, we can't get one. And so then when I heard that, I was like, so it's going to be a while until I get one because I'm in no sort of priority group. I think maybe my job might try to be like, we have people on site, please let us get a vaccine. But to me, I'm like, if people in the medical field can't get it, I'm not getting one anytime Mm. soon, you know? But I did want to ask you, um, because we were talking before, are you and Alan thinking of going like on a camping trip or something? That is so interesting that you said that because just today we decided, we haven't made any plans yet, but I texted him and I was like, we got to do something. Like, I, like <laughs> I'm going crazy. And so I suggested we find like a cabin somewhere that has a hot tub. I was like, those two things, I think that would be great. Yeah, it's like secluded, but like nature that we could walk around in because I really haven't been outside that much and I would love a hot tub. Um, So yeah, we're going to try to make plans this weekend because I was asking all my couple friends, I was like, what are y'all doing? Because it's like, like, I mean, even people who are just living with like a roommate, I mean, it's just like rough. It's just like, like... I love you, but I'm only seeing you in this one setting all the time, always at every single moment. It's like too much. Yeah. And I like, I even feel like just being in a different location will be like, wow, I'm like, wow, I, it's a feast for a, a feast of an experience. Whereas like, I'm just eating potato chips every day right now. <laughs> yeah. I know. That's like one thing I am very, I feel like, um, I don't know how to put this. It's like I take care of myself, but I'm also taken care of by mm. like, I don't know, the universe or whatever, because mm. um, I live on my own with these cats and that's perfect for me because mm. I feel like I'm a pretty nice person, but I would <laughs> fucking lose my shit if I had to be with you or Quinn or Mr. C or anybody. It doesn't even matter who the person is. I would just like... I. I I, I go bananas. I don't know. Yeah, you do go bananas. Like, I'm saying that oh, as yeah. in like, I, yeah, yes. Like, yeah. I'm learning new levels of like, and again, it's like, you know, uh, listen, I know, I know my honey will, will be listening to this podcast at some point. It is nothing that he has done. He could, there, there's nothing he could do. There, there's like, there, there's yeah. nothing to be done. It's just like, it, it, <laughs> like, I could be anyone, you could be anyone, and we would be feeling this way, you know, because it's just Absolutely. like, yeah, if you like hit your hand with a hammer, it would hurt. So it's like, yeah, if if you have to be stuck inside at home with no other experience, you're going to get like stir crazy. Um, and so then it's like, all right, so let, let's just like try to think of something different. And then my friends were like, well, go on a, go on like a weekend trip. And I was like, Yes. I am doing that. <laughs> I have to. At this point, it's like a, it's for, for my health. <laughs> oh, I think that's a great idea. I wish I could too. I think that'd be really, really fun. I wish you um, could too. Yeah. At some point I will. Um, but I also, um, what you mentioned before about doing little tasks. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that is great advice. Like I also scooped the boxes nice. and I vacuumed um, ha- half of the living room and half of this room mm-hmm. and a um, little bit in the corridor. Really corridor <laughs> but it's a hallway. <laughs> um, and I feel, and I feel, and I, I moved some clothes around and I put, okay, I had clothes on the floor in the laundry room and I put them in a basket. Doesn't sound like a lot. No. I. But it changed that's good. my whole world. Yes. <laughs> I, you know, claps for you because that, that's, that is a lot. Like, it, listen. Oh my God. I feel like. Now more than ever, yeah. that's a lot. <laughs> I folded some blankets. I mean, I. Come on. So. I mean, <laughs> but here's what else I did today. I watched Ponyo because I'd never seen it before. Or Ponyo, I don't know how you pronounce it. And then I watched, well, I'm watching a K drama called Me Sang because mm-hmm. I had gotten off my um, K dramas. And 
I watched the monster one, Mm -hmm. uh, Sweet Home. Mm -hmm. And then I watched Strangers from Hell or Slash Hell is Other People has two titles. Um, I liked it better than Sweet Mm. Home. I'm interested now. Um, (laughs) It's more of a thriller, Mm -hmm. but it's got... um, Oh, I don't have her name. I I wrote it down. But she was the original housekeeper in Parasite. Mm, the mm-hmm. one who's like a married to the guy in the basement. Um, she's in it. Mm-hmm. And then there's this actor who apparently is like r- like really huge. I think he's a little strange looking, but <laughs> he's like he's like a big like uh, phenomenon in mm-hmm. South Korea. His name is um Lee Dong Dong Uk, and um, he's just kind of tall and stringy. Doesn't do it for me, but um, he's we know like that's not your popular. type. Not at all. But he's got a really f- interesting face, and mm. he plays the bad guy, and he does a really good mm. job. <laughs> do you? <laughs> Whenever I am like editing the podcast, I always at least once hear Wolfie. Oh, I don't hear Did her now, hear her but now? I love hearing her. Oh, okay. I can't she hear just her now. Announced though. herself. I'm here. <laughs> Come here. Welcome to me. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, next, should we get into it? Let's get into it. <laughs> okay. What? Well, how? So let the right one in. How old was I when we first watched it? <laughs> Let me interrupt you for a second. <laughs> okay. Well, it came out in tw- – sure. It came – well, one thing I was thinking about, because I, I don't know if we if we watched it right when it came out, but it came out in 2008. And in 2008, you were 12. And the characters in this movie are 12. So I thought that was oh, kind of funny. Oh, interesting. I mean, we probably saw it that year or the next year, 2009, I'm guessing. Because – I I really remember a lot of big things, but then I remember when I read the book, I was like, I don't remember this. And then when I watched the movie again, now I was like, don't remember that. Or like, I probably saw it, but I didn't register as this is what I'm looking at right now. Um, I only remembered the oh, big yeah. things um, from when I first saw it. And I don't know how many times I've seen the original um Probably four or five. Mm. I really like it a lot. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, this time I watched the American version first. That's what I um, did too. And then a couple of days, yeah, a couple of days later I watched the Eridge. But um, okay, oh. so Let the Right One In came out in two thousand eight, um, and the pronunciation again is going to be brutal. I looked up on that website how you say <laughs> this word. In in Swedish, if you have an A with a little O over it, it's like a O sound. So oh. Kore Hedebrant as Oscar. Uh, Lena, now there are three people who play Ellie. Mm-hmm. Um, Lena Lee Anderson uh, is the girl. Mm-hmm. But Elif Ceylon is the girl's voice. And then um, Suzanne... Ruben is the aged Ellie, mm-hmm. which we only see for a second. Yeah, it's like a flash. Um, yeah. Uh, per Ragnar as Horken. Henrik Dahl as Eric. Karen Berquist as Yvonne, Port Yvonne. And Peter Karlberg as Laka. Mm-hmm. So here's some trivia. Several tricks were used to create the right sound effects for some of the gorier scenes. Mm. Biting into sausages was used <laughs> to replicate biting into the skin and flesh, and drinking yogurt was used to sound like drinking blood. Shout out the to Onks, who children... had a great sausage eating scene. Do you remember that sausage oh, eating God. scene? <laughs> Your face yes! Instantly. I I must have repressed it, because I just like... <laughs> That whole movie, that whole experience was like, why are we doing this? <laughs> Whose idea was it? P.S. It was mine. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, 
Now, okay, going back to Anks, do you think that that movie influenced um, uh, Haneke mm. to make funny games or no? Because they would have seen it as a child. In the way that I feel like you could say, you know, eating, eating, uh, you know, the, the vampire Cocoa Puffs maybe would make you... It's like it's like it's a movie. It exists, but I don't think you can give that movie or its or its writer whoever any credit to. <laughs> it's just, okay, it's not very good. I thought I had a pretty solid case, and then we watched the movie. I was like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> um, I mean, I think what made that movie so disturbing was the fact that it was based on an actual case, and then if yeah. you read the actual case, mm. it's actually worse than oh. what we saw in <laughs> angst. Yeah. <laughs> Great. <laughs> uh, all right. So Thomas Alfredson, who is the director, was initially asked to direct the remake, but he said, and this is kind of lengthy, but he said, initially they approached me to do the remake, but I decided not to participate in it. I am too old to make the same film twice, and I have other stories that I want to tell. I think that it is a little sad. I wish that American viewers would just see the foreign language version. When I first got asked about the remake, I said, can you not just get everyone to see this one? <laughs> it's a perfectly good film, you know? You know, and <laughs> I I get his sentiment, and that is what I would say about most remakes, but spoiler alert, I enjoyed the changes they made in this one. And... I think it stands on its own and I'm glad he didn't direct it because I really like the vision that this director had. I'm not saying that I like it better, but I think both interpreted the text differently, but correctly still, mm -hmm. even though the American one doesn't do a lot of things that is literally done, you know, and I'm not saying like, oh, I mean, everyone has to listen to me. I read the book, but I did read the book and... The vibe I got from the book, I felt more in the American one than in the Swedish one. But I still think both are good. But yeah, I'm glad that somebody else directed it because I liked, I liked that energy. I liked having two different energy. It was like eating two different kinds of chocolate cake that both taste really good. They're both chocolate cake, but it's like, oh, this one tastes like this and this one tastes like that. Okay. <laughs> oh. uh, well, Tomas um, Alfredson, who directed the Swedish version, also directed Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy. Oh, well. And Matt Reeves. <laughs> I hated that movie. I know, not your favorite. I, I loved it, but I'm, I grew up with, you know, watching um, spy stuff when I, you know, with my mom when I was little. But anyway, mm -hmm. Matt Reeves directed the remake, the American version, and I told you not to look it up on the internet what else he directed. He also directed <laughs> Cloverfield. <laughs> great movie. Not a great I know. movie, but I, it is a movie I like. <laughs> Okay, so what we're going to do is, um, again, I've taken this from Wikipedia. Just go paragraph by paragraph and see what we want to talk about. Then we can talk about like some of the differences in the, in the movies and the novel and like that. So Oscar, a meek 12-year-old boy, resides with his mother Yvonne in the western Stockholm suburb of Blackaberg in 1982. His classmates regularly bully him, and he spends his evenings imagining revenge, collecting clippings from newspapers and magazines about murders. One night, he meets Ellie, who appears to be a pale girl of his age. Ellie has recently moved into the next-door apartment with an older man, Hoken. Ellie initially informs Oscar that they cannot be friends. Over time, however, the two begin to form a relationship and exchange Morse code messages through their adjoining wall. Ellie learns that Oscar is being bullied by schoolmates and encourages him to stand up for himself. 
Oscar enrolls in weight training classes after school. Yeah, Oscar, he, I, I do like the way that Oscar looks. And I mean, I know that the kid in the American one can't help the way he looks, but it's like that kid looks, listen, I've never been to Sweden, but that kid looks Swedish. Like, and that kid just looks like a child. Like, and he acts like a kid. Um, and I also really like the way that um, Eli looks, although I do think I understand why they why they got someone else to voice Eli to give you know her this like like adult energy because technically I mean if we're just talking about years Eli has walked this earth like older than you and I but it's still I I will say I here's already there, there's just like so many differences actually to me in the American and the Swedish one. Cause like I would say in the American one, Eli is now Abby played by Chloe Moritz. And that one is just played as like young girl who you would like, just she sounds young and she acts young. Whereas like Eli in let the right one in is like very like, like that kid was great at acting with confidence and like the sureness of, being an adult, you know, in a kid's body. I thought, I thought that that, that kid was great. Um, uh, and, uh, I, I did find it very interesting. The, the difference in the bullies at school call Oscar in the Swedish one piggy, but in the American one girl, um, I thought that was very intriguing. Yeah, I, I think I figured that out. Well, did you have a thought about that? I, well, uh, it, it, I, in a way, I kind of in, enjoyed the the idea of it because it's tough because the American one we'll get into it, you know, but it doesn't it doesn't include this one aspect of the story that is very important in regards to gender. However, if it did, I feel like that actually would have been a lot more interesting um with the main insult of this kid being, oh, you're a girl, you're a girl, you're a girl. Like, look at this little girl. Um, but then, you know, in the movie, like, Abby is is a girl and is, like, the most badass one in the movie. Most, like, ferocious mm -hmm. and, like, strongest one in the movie. Um, and so I kind of – I just – I don't know. I kind of thought it was a little bit interesting. Like, I don't think they were trying to say anything, but um, it still kind of lent to, like, an interesting – dynamic of this kid that's the that's the name with which he is you know burdened by you know it's 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 his insult and yet um it's his savior in a way i think in the initial draft of the script they use the f word instead <laughs> that could be true that could be true i mean we're talking like early 80s and mm -hmm. um, if you really want to insult a male classmate, that's what you would say. Yeah. But I'm guessing they they didn't want to um, mm. use that word in the yeah. movie. And so they yeah. changed it to girl. Piggy would have been fine too, though. I mean, I guess the kid is really tiny yeah. and like slender. So I guess it, I mean, and Oscar is too. I'm not saying you should call anyone a piggy, but like specifically in the Swedish <laughs> one, it's like they, like the kid presses up against Oscar's nose and is like, oink, oink, you're a piggy. Um, and in a way, I kind of saw it. Like, I, like, not to be rude to this kid, but I was like, I see where this insult would come from in this kid's daily life. I don't mean this in a mean way, but like you could never call the American kid a piggy. Like he in no way resembles a hog. Well, Oscar in the original. <laughs> yeah, I think he looks like a kid and his nose is always running. He's always got snot <laughs> like yeah. running down his nose. Literally a snot nose kid. And Yeah, and he... He's not cool. No. I mean, he's not cool. No. You know, and no um, way. the other one, the other kid, is, you know. He's got confidence. He's, he's, yeah. I mean, he, he, but, but the, um, like kind of jumping ahead a little bit, but there's one scene where the bullies, um, use this like switch mm -hmm. on, um, Oscar and one kid like 
like hits him on the legs, like with, you know, through his pants. But then the other one like gets him across the face mm -hmm. and he just takes it. He yeah. just takes it. And um, he is very passive. I mean, he's just a passive kid. He's got his little weird interests and stuff like that. He's kind of a weirdo. I mean, I'm not blaming him. I mean, everyone's trying to figure out who they are at that age. But he's a very awkward kid. He doesn't, you know, he he answers questions in class. Yeah, <laughs> like, excitedly. You know, in, he's in like, you know, I know. He, yeah. 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 And um, even the people who, you know, the teachers are like, okay. Yeah, like, all right, Oscar. They don't know really what to do with him either. Yeah. Um. So he's just an awkward kid. Mm -hmm. um, so and, and uh the the something that the th this was like kind of something that i i took a large part away from the the two tellings is that like to me um the american one really the whole world revolves around um american oscar what's his name owen or owen it, owen yeah it, like they don't include any – there's no meaningful, really, characters besides Owen, um, Abby, and the creep Abby, um, you know, who who lives with Abby. Um, whereas in the book and in the Swedish version, like, Ab, um, Eli has an effect on this whole suburb. Like, there is a whole cast of characters who are – have their own wants and dislikes and – their lives have a ripple effect, or Eli has a ripple effect in their lives. Um, whereas, yeah, in the American one, it really is the story of this kid, which I found interesting. Um, I I like both in a way because I think that the 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 story of being a weird dinky kid and like getting roped into you know being with this because I mean like. Like, little vampire girl is playing him like like a fiddle it, to me, and you know because I mean, well she, she's she's got this guy who helps her who's killing people for her. Um, that this mm -hmm. old guy, H Hagar, is that his name? Hokan. 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 And in the book, he's a legit pedophile. Like he was kicked out of being a teacher because he had child pornography, and I mean. Eli uh, is the has the body of a 12-year-old kid so i mean and he's like in love with her like in a not good way you know um and she knows that and but uses it cuz it's like well you you kill you get me blood cuz i need to eat um and yeah where and um that dynamic is also different in the american one Let's go to the next paragraph. It's about um, Hokan. Okay. okay. Um, earlier, Hokan stops and kills a passerby on a footpath to harvest blood for Ellie, but is interrupted by an approaching dog walker. <laughs> this part's funny. Ellie is prompted. Ellie is prompted to waylay and kill a local man, Yoka, making his way home after having said goodnight to his best friend, Laka. And he said, I wrote this down because I loved it. He said, thanks for a night of friendship and merriment. I loved that. How I'm going to oh. end every, every oh. hangout now. Oh my God. <laughs> the cat, the cat loving recluse Gusta witnesses the attack from his flat, but in disbelief decides not to report the incident. Hokan hides Yoka's body in an ice hole in the local lake. Hokan makes another effort to obtain blood for Ellie by trapping a teenage boy in a changing room after school. When he is about to be discovered by the boy's friends, Hokan pours concentrated hydrochloric acid onto his own face, disfiguring it to prevent the authorities from identifying him. Ellie visits Hokan in the hospital. Hokan offers his neck to Ellie for feeding and Ellie drains him of his blood. Ellie goes to Oscar's apartment and spends the night with him, during which they agree to, quote, go steady, though Ellie states, I'm not a girl. Okay, there's a lot there. But, I, um, <laughs> it, I gotta say, so, maybe you feel differently, but um, I really enjoyed 
in the American one, I feel as though it both shows how fucking disgusting this whole plot is and how disturbing it is, but it treats it as if it's this beautiful love story. But I really kind of yeah. like that, like, because it is not, you know, like this guy who would willingly pour acid over his own fit. That's disturbing. Like, and in the book, you know, he's a, like I said, you know, goddamn pedophile. So like, that's disturbing that he would go to these lengths just for this kid vampire that he's in love with. Um, but, uh, the end where she, where she like drinks his blood and he, and he, he can't let her in because he, he's so disfigured. He can't speak. So he has to lean out of the window and she drinks his blood and then, you know, he falls down. I think it's a beautiful scene. Like it, this guy has really given his whole life to her. Well, in, in the American version, we see a picture of, um, I don't know what his name is. I think they call him father in the American yeah. version. He's not a biological father, yeah. but that's just, you know, his name. But um, there's a picture of them where he's a child and she's a child. And so you understand that this old man has been with her, you know, for 60 plus years. She groomed him. Um, and now she's grooming yeah. Owen. Like, I... Right, exactly. I, I don't... I really liked that. Like, I... I... I the guy who, who wrote this, he, he also wrote another novel that I read that I, I think its name was like Starry Kid or something like that. He's got a real thing for describing pedophilia. Like, I don't know. He kind of gives me the creeps, even though he's a great writer. And so, you know... Like, I don't, I don't want to take away from, you know, the, the, you know, his, his portrayal of this because he, he doesn't portray it as like, obviously like a good thing, but it's just, it's something he likes to write about in detail. But I liked this idea of like this kid vampire who, you know, in the American retelling that, you know, she, she's just trying to survive really. Um, and yeah. what better way to do that than to get someone to dedicate their life to you. But it's bad. You know, it's like, it's evil. You're, you know, you're taking this person's whole life from them and making them, I mean, he died in a most violent death and poured acid all over his face. That's not a good ending. Nobody wants that ending, but she, you know, it's like, but he, he wanted to do it though. And I don't, I just find that very compelling in a way. And I really enjoyed because they, they switched the whole dynamic of how he gets his victims in the American one. He has this creepy ass bag over his head and he hides in people's cars. Now, okay. I know that's a fear for a lot of people. And I, I even enjoy the way he gets caught of, um, this time he's, he's hiding in a kid's car, but then he picks up a friend and goes to a gas station and he's just like, oh, fuck. And he just tries to kill one of the kids while the other one goes to the store and drives away. But they throw a slushy on the car and he just crashes it. And then as soon as he can, just takes the acid and pours it all over his face. Um, I got to say that car crash, that car crash is pretty epic. Um, yeah. It's filmed. It's filmed from the inside of the car. Mm -hmm. And so and it's just like doing it's just the the car is just um rolling down this hill and so uh it, it it's it's epic. quite good yeah it's yeah. pretty epic and then um and i liked his Jenkins. prosthetic in the american one he looked scary yeah um i liked it in the original how when he fell out of the window he hit another building before he hit the ground yes that's brutal yeah very yeah. brutal. In both versions, the men lean into mm -hmm. um, the vampire's hand. Mm -hmm. Like she touches the, the face and they lean in like, oh my God, I love this touch. And so I think there is a suggestion, even though it's not stated um, in the... I don't think it was intended in the American version at all. But I think that you could read into that in the oh, Swedish yeah. version. Yeah. That he was a pedo. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And well to, and to me, like, even in the American one, I mean like even if he met her at the age of twelve, he's a full grown man now. Like, you know, right. it, it's if you're still in love with this kid, I mean she's still inhabiting the body of a twelve year old 
kid. Like, that's not okay. So, I mean, either way, I think you could interpret it that way. Uh, Well, in both versions, when he fucks up the first time, Eli yells at him. Like, what do you, what do you want me to do it all by myself? Yeah. Like, um, and it's in the American version, it's pretty rough. Yeah. Um, so, um, but yeah. And in both, it's he, not he a health- asked, <laughs> no, it's not a healthy relationship. <laughs> and I yeah. like that. Cause I, I like just knowing like you're I, seeing it's being presented like, you know, Oscar and Owen being presented as like. In a way, it's cute, but then you you get at the same time, you know it won't be. You know, it's like, you know this is bad. But I feel like, and I'm not, I'm not trying to shame people who, like, have hard-ons for, like, immortal beings or anything, but you kind of... You kind it's what of, you signed up for. It's what you signed up for. Like, what did you think was going to happen? She's going to be 12 forever. You're going to get old. It's not going to be fun, you know, especially if you've got to kill people. Um, <laughs> to, to feed this vampire. Now, I think I read that there is a sequel um, to to let the right one in, really? in which Oscar won't age. They do this like right um, with blood or whatever, and he will not age. I don't but know how I feel about that. In that. This movie. We don't know that in this movie. So mm. let me. Uh, okay. Okay. Let's go on to the next part. Okay. During an ice skating field trip at the lake, some of Oscar's fellow students discover Yoka's body. Okay. I mean, yeah, these two girls are peeing over by this like wood, like piece of wood. And the little girls, they're like so six small. and seven. Yeah. And they're like, just one like, of them's, like pointing. Not so, screaming. Uh, no, 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 just, no. What's that? <laughs> At the same time, the bullies again harass Oscar, who hits the leader Connie in the head with a metal pole, splitting his ear. Sometime later, unaware that Eli is a vampire, Oscar suggests that he and Ellie form a blood bond and cuts his hand, asking Ellie to do the same. Ellie, thirsting for blood but not wanting to harm Oscar, laps up his blood before running away. Laka's girlfriend, Virginia, is subsequently attacked by Ellie. Virginia survives, but discovers that she has become painfully sensitive to sunlight. Virginia vi- visits Gusta, only to be fiercely attacked by Gusta's cats. Great scene. Soon after this, yeah, Oscar confronts Ellie, who admits to being a vampire. I love the lake scene in the original. Mm-hmm. I love it mm-hmm. so much. You've got the, like, Spanish... Um, gym teacher who Mm -hmm. doesn't he's fucking up his swedish yeah and um, he's trying to direct the kids you've got the bullying going on where um oscar like finally stands up for himself but at the same time this body is discovered and then there's like a cut and then the next thing you see (laughs) is they're lifting yoka's body out they had to to cut it out with like chainsaws and stuff. But there's still this like circle of ice around his body that's being lifted up and, you know, going to be taken to the corner or whatever. But it's like, wow. It's a really great scene. Like it's shot amazingly. And like the like chaos of like the teacher being like, what do I look at right now? Um, (laughs) It's so great. One thing I haven't mentioned yet is the, this is a, Sweden in the winter time. Oh God! And the snow is shot so beautifully. I cannot even begin to tell you. Um, the American version, for some goddamn reason, takes place in New Mexico, but there's snow. I understand it snows in New Mexico. Don't, just That's don't bizarre. But the snow in the American version looks like fucking. It's not the foam. same. Yeah, no. it's the, yeah. the the snow in the Swedish version. It's like shimmering and the director takes or the dp you know takes time to like show us the shimmering snow and it's the paper birch trees and that it's just like so beautiful it's its own Um, like story like like because i love the way that they show because the snow is both beautiful but like also like oppressive in a way because it's it's I mean, Oscar, like we said, has like a, is a snot-nosed kid the whole time, snot, like yeah. running down his face. Like that would not be comfortable. And he's trudging in the snow. And and at one point, the bullies, um, you know, uh, uh, 
throw his pants in in the urinal so he has to walk home in his shorts like and you see his little pale ass leggies like oh it must be so horrible and but i love that like i love that they both show that it's like it's so beautiful and then also like if you lived in this like super snowy place all the time it would just be like the snow i gotta deal with <laughs> yeah but they also i mean he oh when he goes to his dad's house it's so much it's fun like yeah super cold yeah and he's like he's doing that little ski thing on the lake and mm-hmm. i mean yeah that's the way i grew up in a cold climate and i used to ice skate and do shit outside and you know you just well it's do. like that's their just, world it's like yeah. I, I feel like what i mean is like when they show all aspects of it, it feels so real. Like, it just feels like we're there. Like, like yeah. we get to see just them living in this, like, incredibly cold area. Um, and it's just a really interesting backdrop for the whole movie, I think. Um, now, in the it, remake, we didn't have the cats. We did not have the cats. And I feel like, yeah, it's a huge... I was waiting for the cats the whole time. And then when the cats never came, I was like... Okay. <laughs> but I I didn't I I think I think I I like the story of Virginia in the Swedish one better cuz like I said it's like it's interesting to see and it's more real to see Eli have a whole effect on this whole suburb not just one kid because really like I get that the, in the American uh, an aspect of it is that Owen has absent parents, but like they're hella absent. Like they're more absent than absent. Like he might as well be an orphan. Like, and I get that that's part of it, you know. And but I think it could have done with a little bit more subtlety. I think that. Um, where, but whereas in the Swedish one, in a way, like they they have a scene with his dad where you know we, we get we we then get the whole story of his dad and how it's not perfect and it's it's not a perfect family life that we had cuz his dad drinks a lot and you know is he's trying to enjoy this time with his dad but then his dad's buddy comes over and they just start drinking and and he stops playing with Oscar and it's really sad um in a really subtle way like a really like you can just tell Oscar's like oh you know um but his relationship with his mom seems great. Like they're brushing their teeth together and they're both just like making faces at each other. And I thought it was like pretty sweet. Um, where, whereas in the American one, I saw in your notes, like, yeah, we don't even like see his mom's face. <laughs> yeah. They, yeah. <laughs> we literally never see her face. Every evening um, she's drunk on the couch. <laughs> yeah. And he has no dad. In the Basically. American yeah. version. Um, yeah. How about when Oscar finds out that Ellie is a vampire? I love the Swedish scene because she, like, they're they're standing, you know, and she's got this door between them that's like glass, and they both are. It's just really, it's done in a way that's not like super movie cinematic. But it feels really touching, you know, like they're they're both touching, like putting their hands against the glass and following each other's hands as he's asking her questions like, so like, are you a vampire? And she's like, I mean, I live off blood. And, you know, she's explaining like, you you know, I you got to, you know, let me in and, and stuff like that. Um, oh, wait, hold on. But one big thing. Why the fuck did they change the name to let me in? Me and Alan were talking about this last night. Let the right one in is maybe one of like the coolest names I've ever heard. Like it's so neat. It's such a good name. Let me in is like, let me in. <laughs> but like, let the right one in is so like, ooh. <laughs> well, I don't know, um, but I think that the American version, like you were saying, it is kind of just between these two people. Um, um, this, the whole movie just sort of gets boiled down to that. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, let me in, let me into your heart, let me into your mm-hmm. life. You know, it, it's a le- much more direct request than sort of like a piece of life advice. True. <laughs> so, true. I see that. But I, I think no one can deny let the right one in is such a good name. It's like, oh, it just fills you with all this intrigue. Uh, what what do you think about the right. scene where they're where they're talking about uh Eli being a vampire? 
it's tricky because I think Oscar's like, oh, fuck. Like, <laughs> I have feelings for her. And um, I've never really felt this close to anybody before. Um, I suspected that I had this crazy thought that she might be a vampire. That's been confirmed. There are vampires. Like, there's so much going on in his head. And he's 12. And, um, and he's 12. And But what I love about it and what I love about both versions, actually, um, I know I haven't spoken very positively about the remake, but um, I guess I'm just so attached to the first one. It's hard to... It makes sense. Yeah. But one thing I think both of them did really well is when she asked the question, what if I weren't a girl? I love that. Would you still love me? And the kid in the American version is like, I guess so. Yeah. He doesn't have... Yeah, I mean, okay. He doesn't have... And Eli... I mean, um, Oscar is a little more reticent, like, whoa, wait, what do you mean? Like, what does that mean? Like, he's got to wrestle with it a little bit. Mm-hmm. But then when he gets there, he's like, yeah, I guess that wouldn't matter. And I just like it that they both come to that conclusion. Like, it's not a big deal. Yeah. And yeah, I we, we were kind of discussing like the gender aspect before. And um, again, I do not think... Lindquist, the guy who wrote this, is like, you know, knows anything about, I'm guessing, doesn't know anything about trans rights or anything. But to, as someone, you know, who falls outside of the gender binary, I, I really just, in, I really enjoyed that. I mean, I think anyone could enjoy that sequence, but it just gave me like a special feeling inside because it just was very, like, I, I just felt very real. And like, obviously, you know, what what Eli means is, well, should should I reveal? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so, it's not a secret. So Eli um, is, and they even say this in the book, um, and Oscar, they hint at it in the movie, but it's not like explicitly said because when Oscar learns Eli's name, he goes, Eli, um, because Eli is short for Elias and is a boy's name. And in the book, it like right when he meets Eli is like, this is weird because this girl has a boy's name. Um, and Elias was assigned male at birth, um, was castrated at some point, um, and, you know, is presenting though as largely female. Now, again, Eli straight up says, I'm not a girl. Like, let's get, and I mean, that's when Oscar asks Eli to go study. She's like, um, and he's like, well, yeah, you'll be my girlfriend. And she's like, I'm not a girl. Like, and so, you know, Eli's not saying, you know, this is how I identify, um, but largely how everyone perceives Eli is, oh, that was a girl that I saw a girl attack him. You know, she is a girl. Um, so it's kind of nebulous. Um, I think Eli, Eli herself is just like beyond, I mean, she's like a 300 year old vampire, like gender, I don't really think has a meaning, you know, to this not human creature, you know, (laughs) but, um, uh, I... Well, when <laughs> Eli is changing into a dress, um, there's also no penis. Yeah. So this person has no genitalia, mm-hmm. no functioning genitalia mm-hmm. um, at all. Yeah. And so, um, and Oscar sees that as like, what? <laughs> <laughs> like, oh no. Yeah. But um, but I think if if Oscar had seen a penis or you know, a vulva or anything, he probably would have freaked out in the same way. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. he's yeah, 12 yeah. and he's, you know. Never seen somebody naked before. But I think it, more for more for us, the audience, than for It's Oscar like things are himself. not what they seem. Yeah, it's like there's there's a larger story here. Yeah, and well, the, the, the American the one best... does not even get into it. Oh, no, doesn't even. But that's one thing I really like about this character. Um... So, uh, assigned male at birth, but n- not a girl. Um, so, kind of like, w- what is, yeah. what are they? Yeah. We don't know. Also, is a child, but also is 300 years old. So, <laughs> like, a lot of questions. There, there was a one question, uh, you know, 
how old are you or whatever. Mm -hmm. And she says, I'm 12, but I've been 12 for a long time. And, and I, I, I really like, cause it's like, this is not something that exists in our world, you know, obviously like there's no, there's no, I mean, I'm, I'm guessing no 12 year old vampire out there who's been 12 for 300 years, but I do just really like this thought experiment that Linquist um, like gets into with this character of just like, cause it's not as though this is a 300 year old being who's walking and talking around. Like there's still an aspect of like being a kid, you know, of like having some, like, because I, I don't think Eli is playing everyone for a fool and being like, oh, I'm just pretending to be – everything I do is for show. I do think like, you know, um, you know, I do think Eli and Abby play people to their advantage, you know, obviously with getting somebody to fucking murder for them. But um, I, it doesn't feel as though this is just a, a omniscient being and just a 12-year-old's body. Like it does feel as though – yeah. This is a 12-year-old who's been 12 for 300 years. Like, I don't know how, how better to explain it than that, you know? And I think that's really interesting. Me too. It's like an impossible being. Yeah. I mean, and, it makes no and sense, and yet it does. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's um, go on. Um in the hospital, Virginia asked the orderly to open the blinds in her room. Okay, mm -hmm. well, we've got to back up for a second. So Virginia Great. was um, attacked by Ellie. Mm -hmm. uh, when she looks at the wounds, the very deep puncture mm -hmm. wounds on her neck, but she is very sensitive to light, mm -hmm. and um, the cats attack her. The cats, are, like, hiss and get their backs up when they see her, and then they they swarm her. Yeah. And she's in the hospital. And in this version, it's like a suicide because she knows that when the person opens the blinds, the sunlight will hit her and she'll catch on fire or something. Yeah. And that's exactly what happens. It, yeah. In the American version, it's more of an accident. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's like she's not as self-aware of her yeah. situation yeah she doesn't she doesn't even she's acting purely on instinct in the american like she wakes up and is like oh blood and just starts chewing on her arm because i i see it as just this like hungry creature who's just like this feels good i'm going to do this and the nurse is like let me open up a blind you know and then poor nurse catches on fire too um but i i like the story a lot better in the swedish and the original of this woman being cognizant of like Okay, because they they've been they've been pondering who this girl is that killed their friend because the guy with the cat said it was a girl yeah. and they're like girl what and so you know now she knows like oh I was attacked by a girl I'm gonna be that and she just and she asks yeah. her 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 hubby Bo um I don't think they're actually married but um she's like please like I want. Like, please kill me. And he's like, he doesn't get it. Like, he's like, I, he's like, no, 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 it's going to be okay. Like, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm selling my stamp collection. So, so, you know, I can, I can pay for you. It's really sad. And so, you know, yeah, she asks before, before the doctor is going to let her go, she's like, oh, will you just open up the blinds real quick? And oh, an amazing scene, like just her bed erupting into flames. It's so good. Yeah, it's pretty great. Um, all right. So Laka tracks Ellie down to the apartment, breaking in. He discovers Ellie asleep in the bathtub. Everything's, you know, obviously the windows are boarded up so sunlight can't get in. And Ellie is like in the bathtub, um, like under a blanket or two. And there's like cardboard over that. <laughs> I mean, I really don't want to make sure that no light gets in there. Yeah. He prepares to ca kill Ellie, but Oscar interferes. Ellie wakes up, jumps on Laka, and feeds on his blood, killing him. Oscar is initially upset by Ellie's need to kill people for survival. However, Ellie insists that they are alike, in that Oscar wants to kill, and Ellie needs to kill, and encourages Oscar to be me for a little while. Ellie thanks Oscar and kisses him. However, an upstairs neighbor is angrily knocking on the ceiling due to the disturbance. Ellie realizes that it is not safe to stay and leaves that night. 
an amazing scene because when she, when she kisses Oscar goodbye, like in both versions, she's just eaten a man and has blood, and so <laughs> Oscar has all this blood over his mouth. I just think it's like amazing visual storytelling of just like this romance is bad like dude don't do this you know and <laughs> and i mean like and in both ones like oscar and owen make a conscious choice to not help you know the guy because in the, in the american it's it's there's been an investigator the whole time um and he's eaten um wh whereas you know in the swedish it's like this guy is, wants to kill you know, it's like, I'm going to kill this little bitch who, who killed, you know, my, my best friend and my girlfriend. Um, but yeah, I, I really, I mean, the character development of Oscar being like, I guess this is the choice I'm making is I'm not going to help this person. Like, I'm going to watch, know that he died. I mean, he does close the door to the bathroom, but he knows. Um, and oh yeah. And then there's like a great scene where, where Eli comes up behind him and hugs him and just goes, thank you. Cause I mean, she knows that, you know, if it weren't for Oscar, she would have been dead. Um, and yeah. And oh, the scene where she goes, be me for a little bit, like suddenly there's a flash, what we were saying earlier of her having a, a an older actor played her, like you just see like the top of her head, but you can tell it's somebody who's a lot older and it's just very like, I don't know, surreal. This movie's so good. <laughs> yeah. I guess all the implications of what it would be like to um, be with mm. an immortal being, you know, are kind of kind of occurring to Oscar at that point. Mm -hmm. The next morning, Oscar is lured out to resume the after-school fitness program at the local swimming pool. The bullies, led by Connie and his older brother Jimmy, start a fire to draw Mr. Avila, the supervising teacher, outside. They enter the pool area and order the children, aside from Oscar, to clear out. Jimmy forces Oscar under the water, threatening to stab his eye out if he does not hold his breath for three minutes. While Oscar is being held underwater, Ellie arrives and rescues him by killing and dismembering the bullies, except for the most reluctant of their number, Andreas, who is left sobbing on a bench. Perfect. Ooh, it's just like perfect. a perfect scene. It's just like a perfect, like, <laughs> this belongs in the fucking MoMA. Like, this is like one of the best pieces of cinema that's ever existed. That's not an exaggeration. <laughs> like, because all of that violence happens off screen, but not because all you see is Oscar under the water with the yeah. hand holding him. And then you see that they really, they really poignantly at one point because Oscar at first thinks everything's fine because one of the boys who calls him out was like, hey, by the way, I love that shit that you did to Connie. And Oscar's like, really? And so that kid is there and he's like, yeah, Oscar, <laughs> I'm going to help you with your, with your, you know, swimming moves. And I love the kid that played Oscar. He's like inhaling the pool water. Like, uh, <laughs> do you, did you notice that? It's like, he just has his whole mouth open, like, like taking in pool water, spitting it back. <laughs> um, like he's just a total <laughs> dork. Um, but they, they show the kid's shoes as he's like, go like doing these steps. Cause then later in the pool, they show the shoes in the water, like being dragged. It's just like the visual storytelling is so good and then the hand holding oscar's head gets detached and it like falls off and um and even before that even before eli gets there like the scene where all the kids are watching as connie's older brother who's like you know a little bit older than like a teen whereas they're like kids they're all feel uncomfortable and it's just these actors these kid actors did such a great job like the kid who sits down like it just felt so real of this kid being like I'm in way over my head. Like, I didn't know it was going to be like this. I'm so scared. Like, cause even Connie's like, Hey, um, Hey, don't, don't drown this kid. And he's like, shut up. And like, this kid's like, you know, prepared to kill Oscar basically. And the other two kids yeah. are just watching and the other kid sits down and it's just so good. Like that's a five-star scene. Now, we haven't talked about whether or not this movie is a horror movie. Um, I mean, in some case, in some senses, I think it's a coming-of-age story. Mm. Um, Oscar definitely loses his innocence um, throughout the course of this movie. But the 
the <laughs> this scene I think is what qualifies it Cinches as horror. It. And the Andreas crying all alone as there are these decapitated, dismembered child bodies, like you know, around this pool is horrifying. I just got chills. <laughs> There's like blood in the water. Yeah, it's at one just, point you see a head go in the water. So great. It's like Oh, it's otherworldly. And like, yeah, the fact that this kid is left is almost his own fucking torment that he's like left alive having ex- yes. witnessed all of this. It's like no one left that, you know, okay. Um, and then Oscar, when he emerges and sees just – you just see Eli's like – Eye, like top up like eyes up and there's you just see a faintest like of blood splatter and oscar just like smiles the biggest smile oh it's so good <laughs> it's amazing i think definitely this was better done so, the swedish one world this scene like the american one can't compare like this one even if they tried to do a shot for shot yeah. it wouldn't have been as good i think so that now we're basically at the end of the film. Um, Oscar's traveling on a train with Ellie in a box be- beside him. From inside, Ellie taps the word kiss to Oscar in Morse kit. Sorry. Ellie taps the word kiss to Oscar in Morse code, to which he taps back small kiss. I didn't know what, what he had tapped. Thank you for giving that detail. Now... One thing we hadn't talked about just briefly is that um, Oscar is playing with a Rubik's Cube. It is the 80s. He's playing with a Rubik's Cube in the beginning, and um, he can't figure it out, but Ellie figures it out, obviously. So they share a love of puzzles, which I really Mm -hmm. like. Um, Mm -hmm. And so Ellie, I mean, Oscar realizes that right away. And so he writes out morse code the alphabet and morse code so that they can communicate through the wall to each other that they share Um, yeah they share a wall in their apartment i just man it's so good (laughs) yeah so i i found some differences from cinema blend and from collider um differences between the movies so some of these we've already touched on um Non-linear storytelling. So in the American version, um, uh, in the Swedish version, it's all beat by beat by beat. But in the American version, we hop around a little bit. I didn't mind that. In the I, American version, it, there's... It started with yeah. that with the, um, um, uh, Abby's helper being, you know, already have the acid and the, and the reporter character. Because if they had to add a character in, which I don't think they did, but they did... They at least I think did it in a pretty good way. Whereas like this guy's whole role in this movie, like he's almost like us in like learning what it is and he dies. Um I think I think it's done well. I don't think it was necessary, but I see what they were going for. Yeah. Um yeah. Uh addition of the detective character. Oh, and some other faces never shown. Uh, there's no CGI cats, <laughs> uh, no father. Um, we just hear his voice over the phone. The car crash scene was added. Um, oh, God. Okay, this is one thing that did kind of annoy me about the American version. It takes place in 1983, and boy, they really hammer that it's oh, 1983. Yeah. Over so and over and got, over again. We got the now and laters. Reagan is on the television. It's 10 oh, God, p.m. Was... Do you know where your children are? Uh, and like I said, I think the F word is probably the insult of the day that Mm -hmm. makes more sense that they would have used that. Well, I don't have a traditional what has Maxine for this week, um, sort of have a mishmash, but (laughs) since we were sort of talking about, um, loving an immortal, um, I do have a couple of things that we had sort of talked about earlier today. Um, did you want to talk about Torchwood and the relationship? Sure. Yeah, I I thought of Torchwood because, um, well, the again, like I, I I don't think that the the American remake is definitely honestly its own thing to me now at this point because it's like I think the core story is very different than the Swedish and the original novel, but it 
it does kind of really focus on to me. Well, I mean, obviously the Swedish one too, but like, you know, this idea of, I think because we see her, the father in the original one, we know that they he grew up with her. Um, it really hammers home that that's what's gonna be happening to Owen. And I thought of Torchwood because um, Torchwood is not a perfect show. Uh, is it entertaining sometimes? But I was very into it for a little bit because a big part of it was. Jack, who is an immortal being, was with Yanto, a human, and this was like a recurring thing in their relationship with Yanto feeling inadequate because he would find like a picture of Jack with an old lover and be mm. like, oh, one day you're going to be with another lover. That's not me. I'm going to die. And, you know, he was saying to Jack, like, you know, you, you're an infinite being. I'm going to be a blip in your history whereas like for for me you are everything and that kind of you know cognitive dissonance and i just think it's a really interesting thing to explore because jack tries to tell him like but for right now like you're my everything and it's like but buddy it's just it's playing in my mind you know how i'm gonna die you're gonna look like this and you know you'll forget me one day you know is also what yanto says is like you have to if you live infinitely you will forget me one day yeah i think that's interesting because i think you know even if we're not involved with an immortal being <laughs> mm -hmm. you know we have these fears that we love our partner more than our partner loves us or you know they have much so much more significance to us mm -hmm. um something like that or like that, even if God forbid the relationship should end, that we could become a memory, a lost memory. Um, yeah, it makes, you, it makes you feel so you know insignificant when mm -hmm. you, you feel like you really love this person so much. So, yeah, I think that's something. And, yeah, and and I think it ex it's explored briefly but poignantly in Let the Right One In and, and Let Me In of. Um, at one point, uh, the father, you know, says to, um, Abby slash Eli, like, I don't want you talking to that kid. And it's like, you gotta think like, I mean, as that guy, you gotta feel like shit, you know, of just like, here I am risking life and limb to get you blood. And I see you already making your plans for when I'm gone and who you're grooming to be your next, like my predecessor, like that must not feel good, you know? And um, he used to, and in the American one, that used to be him, you know, of like, I used to be the kid, you know, that you were, I mean, it's disgusting, but you know, I used to be the kid that you as a vampire were grooming. And I just thought that was a really interesting dynamic. It's tragic. Mm. Um, I wrote down, um, Buffy. Um, I don't know how much Buffy you watched, if any. I watched, yeah, I, I watched all of Buffy, but I was really young. But I know, yeah, Buffy and, and Angel and Spike. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Angel's a vampire and so – and Buffy's a high school age girl. Mm -hmm. So it's a gross. little – it's kind of gross in a way. Um, I mean, in a similar way that this is kind of gross. Um, but <laughs> – yeah, but in this, but but uh, angels was turned when he was like, I don't know, whatever, twenty four or something. You know, he was a young man when he was turned. So it's the same kind of dynamic going on there. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, again, it's like this impossible. Um, you know, they have this deep connection and 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 they love each other so much, but they they just, really can't be together. Yeah. There's, there's it's no also like sleeping with the enemy a little bit. <laughs> yeah, well yeah. <laughs> also if he there's a curse on him, it's like a double whammy. There's a curse on him if he experiences bliss, then he turns evil. <laughs> so he can't so ever silly. have an orgasm. Yeah. So um <laughs> Let's see. We we did want to mention Twilight, which again I think it still has that gross factor because um, Robert Pattinson's character again is like, you know, centuries old. It's like shot for shot the same scene too of like, so how old are you? Well, I'm 16. How long have you been 16? A long time. And it's like <laughs> okay. <All right. laughs> um. 
Let's see. Now, A Girl Walks Home Alone at Night, we have already talked about that on this podcast a couple of times, actually. Mm-hmm. Talked about it on the mini, actually. <laughs> oh. I'll we'll keep coming back to it. Uh, but same thing, right? So we have these two beings. We have a human being, and then we have a vampire being. And they it's really up to the guy to decide if he wants to sign on to this or not. Because she's even kind of like, mm, no. <laughs> but then this he's is like, not Please? a good idea. Yeah. And he's like, she's like, okay. <laughs> yeah. I think, but I, I think we can relate. What were you going to say? I, I think this is relatable too, though, because I feel like sometimes, like, I don't think she has low self esteem or anything. I think mm, she yeah. knows her limits. Um, but if you were a person with low self-esteem, I think it, you know, would not be unheard of to say, you don't want this show. <laughs> like, you don't know, yeah. you don't not want to, sh- you know, sign up for this. This is like way more than you think it is. And it's, I'm not and that's sure. Like, yeah. yeah. I think that's a common fear too. I mean, it's a fear like fucking I've had of just like, Listen, I see what you're seeing here, and I'm here to tell you that there's more than meets the eye, and I don't want to be there when you realize it. Like, that's the fear is like, I don't want to be there when you realize that I'm not what you asked for, and then you leave. Because if I get if I get excited now, you know, it's going to hurt when you leave, because then Absolutely. you realize like, oh, you – oh, I thought you were like a really cool person, but it turns out you're crazy. I mean, that's what your brain tells you is going to happen doesn't you know it doesn't always I'm not, I'm not saying that that will inevitably happen to anyone who's crazy like me but <laughs> like you know i think that's just a common fear you know i've i've had that too i've i've had that even with my current partner like yeah we've been together it'll be nine years this year and in the first couple of years i'm like um when are you going to figure it out? <laughs> you are, you're being way too nice to me. Like if you yes. knew what a scumbag I was, mm-hmm. you would run. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's, it's very sad. I don't yeah. have those thoughts anymore, thankfully. Yeah. Um, you know, you're but... <laughs> I know what I have to offer mm-hmm. and I know my worth. Um, and I know, you know, that. I'm worthy of love. I didn't know any of that stuff a decade ago, but, um, you know, I could say a lot more about that, but I did want to mention wings of desire. Wings of desire is a German film that was remade into an American film. I haven't seen the remake, but it's angels. It's not vampires. And what's cool about it is Peter Falk, the actor, used to be an angel hmm. in in the world of this movie. But he decided that he wanted to be a, a mortal. Hmm. Um, so he gave up his immor- mortality. Um, and so there's another angel who has is starting to fall in love with this, um, I, I don't know, she's a circus performer of some kind. I think she's a trapeze artist. Um, but her circus has like gone bankrupt. So she's not Mm. going to be able to perform anymore. So she's really depressed. So anyway, this angel is trying to decide if he should become human because he's Mm. falling in love with this, you know, human. Mm -hmm. Um, So again, it's sort of like a take on the, you know, mortal plus immortal um, (laughs) calculation, but in, you know, in reverse, because the immortal being that now has to decide um, if they want to, Stay immortal, or I love that. So they remade it with Nick Cage and um, Meg, Nick Meg Cage Ryan. Is an angel. I know, and yes, he is. Mm. He's an angel. At least Very odd beginning. casting. Um, another connection I thought. Um, we could talk about really just really briefly is um, unlikely friendships. Mm-hmm. So, friendships with um, now Disney loves the hell out of this trope, um, and I did find a lot of children's um, films. Um, well, one I know that you liked a lot when you were younger is Lilo and Stitch. So good, 
So what did Lilo's you think speech. of their friendship? I love it because um, I think I feel like what those kind of stories try to tap into as kids of like, you feel like um, you as a human, you know, feel like a misfit or you feel like, you know, you don't belong. And I mean, Lilo in that movie is like bullied by other, all the other little girls at her school. And so when she has Stitch, you know, who she just adopts thinking it, she's going to be getting a dog, you know, she gets like it, in her own way, a physical, it, to me, a manifestation of how she feels on the inside. And I just feel like that's a really relatable feeling. And that's why it must be a lot of you know, chill or, or, you know, this feeling of like, it's you and us, it's it, you and me against the world. Um, and yeah, I think that movie, I mean, that movie as a whole, uh, just has a lot of great messages about like family being whatever you make it and, and, you know, um, finding joy, anything as if you find joy in something, it's good. You know, um, I think is that movie's big takeaway. So that's a great message. Yeah, I agree. Um, I, <laughs> I'm trying to think when E.T. came out. Um, I'm going to say it's around 1980. Can you look it up on your clackety clack machine? <laughs> <laughs> Hold on. Give me one sec. <laughs> 1982. <laughs> okay. So in 1982, I was, uh, 13 and I saw this movie I think 11 times in the theater. Oh, um, wow. I love this movie. So have you ever seen it? No. Mac? No. Okay. Wow. Wow. <laughs> wow. That kind of hurts a little bit. I, I wonder what it would be like for you to see it because this was like prime Spielberg um, mm -hmm. before – you know, before Stranger Things, I mean, before people were playing with the Spielberg, this was mm -hmm. like pure, like, uncut Spielberg. And yeah. um, so it's the story of an alien that is left behind, like, a bunch of aliens come down to, like, do some recon, and he's left behind. And mm -hmm. he um, befriends this kid, Elliot, um, who's a who's about maybe 12, you know, um, mm -hmm. and uh, they have to keep a secret from his mom. It's like the the little Drew, Drew Barrymore's like really young, like, oh, like two or three or four. Or something. Oh, my God. Yeah, little, little Drew. Um, so she, you know, little kids are cool with whatever, you mm -hmm. know, but then there's also a teenage brother, too. And then there's the mother. So the the um, existence of this being has to be like um, kind of gradually revealed. But anyway, Elliot and um, E.T. are like super great uh, friends. <laughs> and I, I don't know. It's just so heartbreaking when Elliot has to go. I mean, E.T. has to go back to his home planet. Mm -hmm. But he had <laughs> to <I'm gonna> cry. <laughs> <laughs> It's like really affecting me talking about it. Um but that's what has to happen. And I think yeah. I think for me watching this movie and Elliot the character like understanding that like like I don't know where the dad is. He's either dead or just absent. But that sometimes people we love very much have to go, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's just the way it has to be. Yeah. But E.T., you know, lights up his little finger mm -hmm. and he says, I'll be right here. They, they touch fingers and he says, I'll be right here. Um, and so the idea that they're connected. Yeah. Um, no matter what. And they'll always, they'll always be connected. It's like super yeah. powerful. Sorry. I got really emotional there. <laughs> <laughs> um <laughs> And then I want to talk about um, Ponyo. I watched that today. And mm -hmm. um, Ponyo, as I told you, was <laughs> the story of a little boy. He's five. And um, he forms this friendship with this fish. Mm -hmm. 
But the fish decides that she wants to be human. Mm -hmm. Like as a fish, she eats ham. (laughs) And as a, (laughs) as a fish, a little bit of the boy's blood, she eats a little bit of the boy's blood, like accidentally. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I mean, it's Miyazaki, so it's, like, crazy. There's all this, like, crazy mythos around the whole thing. Like, um, fish are magic. I don't know if you knew that, but... um, Now I do. If she she wants to be a girl, a human girl, she's going to have to give up her magic. Um, Oh. But before any of that happens, as she's, like, you know, going to to the land... um, everything gets fucked up. Like there's like tsunamis and like the moon comes dangerously close to the earth. It's like, everything's out of whack. Mm -hmm. And I like that idea of, um, a friendship causing that kind of, Mm -hmm. uh, mayhem. Yeah. Um, but it, you know, it all comes down to the love of this little boy. If the love, Mm -hmm. if his love is pure enough, then they'll be able to both remain like humans and everything's going to go back the way it should be. Mm-hmm. Um, and it is, his is, 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 and it's a really beautiful story and it's just sort of like fun to watch. It's kind of like, you don't have to do acid. You can just watch a Miyazaki <laughs> movie <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> because it's just like super trippy and yeah. um, beautiful, just beautiful, just beautiful visually. Mm-hmm. Um, but I really liked that. Because sometimes that does happen. Sometimes people meet and they love each other a whole lot, but the society around them is like, this is not okay. Yeah. And um, it causes a lot of mayhem. Yeah. Despite it Um, being a pure, a manifestation of wholesomeness. Yeah. So I like that one. So I would recommend it a lot, you know, um, as a unlikely friendships Mm -hmm. movie. That was, that was very good. So, I think we decided that next time we're going to do one missed call. Yes. Um, I haven't seen either one. Mm, me neither. Um, one of the Demadias liked it. Was it Aaron? I think Aaron liked both versions and Andy liked the um, Japanese version. don't remember. Anyway, um, also... For the mini next week, uh, Quinn and I will be talking about vintage vampire movies mm. and also intergenerational friendships. I love that. So I hope you all will join us for that. You better. And before we go, Wohos, we want to say thank you so much for supporting us. It means the world of horror to us truly. You can follow us on Instagram and Twitter. If you like this podcast, please tell all your friends and leave a good review in the places where people leave reviews. If you want to get in touch with us, you can at worldofhorror96 at (laughs) (laughs) gmail.com. I was trying not to yawn in in the mic. I I think we got your yawn pretty good. No! (laughs) So boring. (laughs) I'm just kidding. One time I yawned while talking to a professor and she was like, am I boring you? And I was like, oh my God, you took it so personally. I'm tired. Tired? You're working me so hard, bitch. I know. I'm a college student. Like, what am I supposed to do? Be awake? I went to bed at two. Give me a break. We love you, Wahos. Don't go into the basement.